Namaste and welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, today will be the offering of the last story in the book of short stories entitled Thanks for the Yellow Roses. It's a very special story, very spiritual with a lot of wonderful black and white photographs in it. I think you will enjoy it for sure. I know I will in reading it. It'll remind me of some special times together with some very special people. Uh, the title of this last uh, chapter is Surrender. The term surrender is often taken to mean a capitulation to some outer influence, a caving in or acquiescence rendered out of fear or a sense of powerlessness or even intimidation. As a basis for this rendering, however, surrender takes on a deeper, more spiritual meaning. Surrender speaks to a letting go of ego consciousness and self-importance, and instead aligning our presence with a full awareness of inner wisdom, that still small voice that surpasses all intellectual and emotional understanding. This noble act is one of true humility, where conventional authority is, aban is abandoned for a deeper source, and where our spiritual ca character and true identity are found and rendered authentic. Naked, we stand before that inner voice, the tongue that speaks spiritual truth, in full acknowledgement of its power in our lives and how it empowers us brilliantly. When fully aware, we surrender completely and thus activate our inner spiritual communion with endless gifts of healing grace. The journey that brought the following images uh, to the fore began more than a decade ago, actually now more than two decades ago, during a, a conversation with an artist friend, Louise Roach in Santa Fe, New Mexico, a dear friend and wonderfully created person, creative person, I wanted to create a single image depicting how marginalized groups or persons are often persecuted and yet even when crucified, nevertheless, show great compassion and empathy for others. It quickly, it quickly became apparent that both the idea and the process were unworkable at the time. Louise suggested I meet with an ex extraordinary artist friend of her own, Patty Levy, her friend. I sensed the pathway had been open for a new consideration, so I took her up on it. Indeed, it was a pathway to openness. During breakfast one morning, Patty volunteered to be a model and suggested that we gain permission to use an abandoned church in Alcalde, New Mexico, to initiate the project. She had a way to it, she said, with no more than a vague idea and a spirit of openness that paved the way for a very special choreography based on spontaneity and mutual trust. Patty and I linked in a spiritual dance that allowed freedom of expression to prevail. I mean, really, freedom of expression to prevail. We were greeted at the front door by a playful, curious dog and a weathered cross, the latter buried in scatterings of wilted wild flowers and dried weeds that had once served another purpose. After a brief discussion, I lifted the cross onto Patty's shoulder, and we entered the inner chambers of the church. It became immediately obvious that the sacred chambers we then entered represented our own spiritual cathedral, from which flowed the inspirational guidance that graced this collection of images. The shadow of light was enchantingly compulsive to our purpose. After several such sessions, Patty suggested that we invite a model, invite a model friend of hers to participate, Daniel Sogan. He did, enjoy, he did indeed join us, adding a commanding presence and a perfect complement to the collaboration. Although Daniel has since passed, his stunning images, not unlike Patty's, provided living testimony to the gifts of life we are. We're, one, we're lent to one another, as the expression goes. It soon became clear to me that the imagery spoke to various ways in which nakedness, crucifixion, and surrender have been conveyed over the centuries, and how those terms also serve as metaphors for how we could not only learn to engage suffering in, in, in our lives, while also learning to keep from letting it cripple us from day to day. I began to feel a rich spiritual texture unfold as we let light find its way into darkness, exposing the demonstration of inner reality onto the outer world, 
in this case, light on the film. I came to see the human form as an extraordinary, beautiful vessel for conveying life as a series of metaphors whose purpose is to reflect deeper spiritual meaning. Images of spiritual truth that await only a fresh, virgin-like perspective. I recognize that this was not a commonly held view, yet it is one that speaks to me, both for the images that found their way onto the film and from the spontaneity of the collaborative process itself. I encourage you to take meaning from your own inward source, not mine. One viewer, for example, has suggested that the images could well speak to the scriptural relationship between Master Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Given the context of spiritual expression, they could provide, they could provide visual testimony to the compassion and personal glory Mary Magdalene must have felt as she accompanied Jesus on his thorny quest to spiritual resurrection and transcendence. Because of the nature of committed relationship, what another goes through often feels as though we are undergoing it along with them, or perhaps even instead of them. Such powerful relational attachment is sure to crucify when we attach our life story to that of one another. And we thus are not being true to ourselves, but rather to the effects of attachment. Through such pain, we come to comprehend that attachment, too, and must be surrendered and that attachment, too, must be surrendered if we are to resurrect to a new spiritual way of life. In my own case, I came to comprehend the imagery as an array of metaphors that emanate from, during, emanate from a daring embrace with vulnerability, standing naked before God, before the truth of our existence, the real truth of our existence. Thus, although nakedness is physical, it also speaks spiritually as a metaphor. The spiritual context allows us to redefine nakedness to mean that our minds and emotions can be cleared, made naked, laid bare, shredding the threadbare clothes of old beliefs, feelings, and opinions in favor of inner wisdom, our truth. When we surrender these ego-conscious remnants, we return to the innocence from which truth speaks. Henceforth, we awaken each day with infinite opportunities to live afresh, indeed, to be resurrected anew. Given this context of innocence, the images in this collection can speak to a wide range of expressions that reflect our profound interconnection with spiritual, spiritual truth, while at the same time engaging life circumstances and situations. Some may well speak to the burdens various cultures place on women, and a necessity to surrender those burdens, both on the part of the women as well as those who have so forcefully and unjustly rendered them, so that sovereign freedom for women and from, the guilt of, and from the guilt associated with unfounded bias can at last reign. The surrendering of burdens placed on men is no less important. Indeed, there are those impositions that would have men bury rather than embrace the more feminine aspects of intuition receptivity, innocence, and the ability to nourish others, those very elements necessary to balance and complete us all. Like eyes, women could be called to demonstrate so-called masculine character traits, like leadership and action orientation, in order to create and maintain balanced life within and without, rather than laying such responsibilities at the feet of their male counterparts or competing with them on their level. The same principles found in spiritual oneness can be applied to burdens placed on disenf other disenfranchised groups and persons. None of us needs another to complete us or to compete with. Rather, our innate need is to celebrate love with those whom we can freely share our own spiritual completeness. The limitations of belief and opinion speak to the material plasticity in which we wrap ourselves. The veils we hold dear yet which keep us looking within in order to one day to claim and demonstrate our spiritual perspectives. After all, we do crucify others and ourselves, usually by distorting or failing to listen carefully to our inner truth and sit in favor of acting our false assumptions about life in general and personal relations in particular. The feminine nature also speaks to the awareness of the need to cut loose the surrender aspects of ourselves in order to make room for new beginnings. It's only by creating a space for the new that our personal resurrection 
can be made whole. On a metaphorical level, this is true without question. Of greatest importance to me is that we learn to perceive life non-judgmentally with each of life's circumstances and confrontations containing the opportunity for demonstrating the essence and embodiment of love. Yes, about being love. And we let ourselves see one another as reflections of our common divine essence. We come to treat both others and ourselves with the dignity spiritual essence commands of us. Thus, our only imperative is to listen while inner wisdom, inspiration, and intuition seeks our awareness. When regularly witnessed, we come to demonstrate only the sacred imprint with regularity. Such demonstration is like turning the kaleidoscope of life with just a slight twist in order to obtain an entirely new beautiful image. In this case, reframing the context from which to discern, to discern our journey less taken. Finally, perhaps Hans Kung's comments can be helpful. Quote, there are many that hang on the cross, not only unsuccessful revolutionary prisoners, those condemned to death, not only the incurably sick, the complete failures, those who are weary of life and those who despair of themselves and the world. There are many who hang on the cross, tormented by cares and oppressed by their fellow men, overwhelmed by demands and worn out by boredom, crushed by fear and poisoned by hatred, forgotten by friends. Is not everyone, in fact, hanging on his or her own cross? A more penetrating comprehension of Kung's contextual framework could indeed lessen the force of those thoughts that frightens us. Thus we lapse into cynicism and skepticism that are so plentiful in today's domesticated, often chaotic society. In a spiritual sense, the cross represents our continued attention on life around us, an erroneous fo focus on outer appearance instead of inner awareness. By focusing on appearance, we obviate our inner knowing, gnosis, our inherent eternal consciousness, thus nailing ourselves on the cross of illusion. Until and unless we focus inwardly to become one with the infinite conscious that is our being, we are crucifying ourselves moment by moment, day by day. Yet in a stroke of spiritual awareness, we are resurrected into being what we truly are, the undeniable conscious awareness of the ineffable one and only. Thus for me, when photographing from our heart space, instead of out of our need to simply capture an image of outer appearance, the moment we frame our lives out of the relation, then out of the relation realization that our innermost being, we are one. We are prompted to release the shutter and doubly etching this image on our hearts as but another reminder. Of this, we can be sure. We already have, we already have all we need for this spiritual journey. When consciously aware, each succeeding step will be birthed out of the womb of silence, through the voice of inspiration and intuition, the language of love, inner wisdom speaks. Our only necessity is to stay fully aware so the gifts of grace can fulfill and become our day-to-day -day reality. Indeed, through surrender come the emanations of innocence that transform. When embraced fully, we are resurrected and transcend into another world, from the world of fear-filled mind to the world of the fearless, love-filled heart. So ends the story of the created dance. Happily so. Oh, yes, as I reflect back on that occasion, it was quite extraordinary. Uh, we were like children in the candy stores. Our head was swirling on our neck with one image after another after another that just simply came out of the relationship into the light of day. No pun intended, or maybe it was intended. I don't know. Uh, so that ends the stories from the Book of Stories, Thanks for the Yellow Roses. I'm so glad I could share these with you. I hope uh, for the most part that it's not the stories themselves that had greater meaning, but rather I hope you were bumped like a bump in the night to want to share your own stories. We all have them. We think we're bad sport. We think many of us that we're bad storytellers. We're not. We're just storytellers, period. Don't let anybody lay that on you. And for goodness sakes, don't lay that judgment on yourself. 
You are a story being told as you live your life day by day. You can't avoid telling that story. And it is a truthful story of what we are day by day being simply love. And so, folks, uh, after this last story in that book, uh, I'll leave you with this uh, anonymous quote from something I found. Speak in such a way that others love to listen to you. Listen in such a way that others love to speak to you. Let me do that one again because it can be a little clever. It's not really, but it's really what this storytelling uh, activity has been between and among us. Speak in such a way that others love to listen to you. Listen in such a way that others love to speak to you. Be good speakers. Be good listeners. By all means, be the love you are. Pure and simple. And so until the next time, we'll start another book. I don't know which one yet, but I've enjoyed sharing this with, with you, this one with you, and hope that you've enjoyed sharing it with me. Until next time then, my friends, namaste. I love you.